so I think we can start now. Uh, welcome uh, to, our, to our third panel uh, today. On the first panel uh, this morning, uh, Tom Medak was talking about these prospects for a, a coalition between uh, trade unions and this kind of non-institutional left-to-left uh, -left that is working in, in, domain, in the domain of civil society, not in the uh, party system, and he was talking about this uh, wave, uh, upcoming wave of new privatizations of public services or commodification of certain uh, uh, state-provided pro state uh, services, and he was talking about that some kind of common interest can, can be fine for these two uh, groups, in the sense that for the activists or, the, or this civil society type uh, of left, the, the rise in prices or the uh, commodification of certain, uh, certain uh, services is a problem as, as such. But on the other side, uh, besides that, for the trade unions, uh, the problem is that this kind of privatization also, uh, we have lots of examples, are uh, usually resulting in the worsening of the working conditions for the workers working, working in, this, in uh, this sector. But I think we, they, we, besides this common interest in common interest in terms of political coalitions, uh, we can also find a deeper, a deeper common interest that, that is usually uh, that usually trade unions do not uh, do not talk about it. They do, do not uh, take this problem into uh, account. That also besides this common interest that that, uh, that I mentioned before, uh, just in terms of uh, commodification of social services and, and some kind of uh, public services or, or their uh, privatizations, uh, the real wage for workers is going, uh, is going down because if you don't have uh, uh, access uh, to the state provided uh, services which was uh, uh, unconditioned, if you have at the same time the level of your wage is the same in the monetary terms, nevertheless your wage in real terms is going uh, is going down. Also, uh, problem is also the other aspect of this process of uh, privatization and commodification is that uh, a huge amount of of, uh, rep of uh, reproductive labor is delegated from the state uh, provided services to the households, meaning that most of, we all know most of those, of that labor being uh, done by women. Also the other part, if you uh, take this uh, trade union uh, problems in perspective that they are not in a sense uh, dealing with the problem of the households in terms of in terms of housing in terms of how do uh, how do workers uh, resolve their their housing uh, issue be it we all uh, have here but not only here uh, this uh, inflation of uh, credits to house to households in terms of credits that be mortgages to buy uh, to buy apartments that also is connected to the to the problem of age and problem of, of, of labor and the problem of, of private debt. But this panel, don't be afraid, it will not be about trade unions. It will be it will be about something much more uh, sexier. It's social reproduction of labor power from different uh, from different aspects. And our second panelist is Dora Levacic. Dora is. Uh, student of sociology on the Faculty of uh, Social Sciences and Humanities in Zagreb. She is a member of the editorial board of uh, magazine Discrepancia and of Organization for Workers' Initiative and Democratization. Uh, and she has published articles on feminism, unpaid house labor, and gender uh, wage gap. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about uh, feminism and the left. Uh, but in order to get to that issue, uh, it is necessary to first uh, first to rethink uh, two core concepts uh, of the problem, namely feminism and capitalism. So I will start with some facts uh, on the position of women in capitalism. Uh, of course, it needs to be said that women uh, have experienced a significant improvement in uh, political and human rights in capitalism. Don't look at the graph yet. So women have experienced uh, a significant improvement in political and human rights in capitalism. Also, the massive entrance of women into, uh, into the labor force in the second half of 20th century has given women 
at least some women, a certain level of economic independency, independence, uh, but it has failed to achieve equality between men and women and has not brought substantial change regarding the sexual division of labor and women's economic subordination in general. Now we can take a look at uh, this graph to support these claims. So first, uh, we can see here in the fourth column, uh, women's rate of participation in the labor market in Europe. So we can see that it, uh, has, uh, it had risen from 30% to around 70% already in the 80s and the 90s, but has since been at the same level without further improvement. Uh, this, uh, the rate of participation of women in the labor market, is often used as an indicator of uh, women's economic equality. Uh, but this percentage by itself does not tell us anything about the jobs that women uh, occupy. Uh, it is important to say that uh, the expansion of the service sector uh, contributed to this job growth from the 60s uh, in Western economies uh, onward. Um, and this uh, uh, expansion of the service sector has been characterized by weakened labor standards and wage bargaining power as well as a movement towards peace rates and part-time contract structures. Um, this inequality of men and women on the labor market takes on different forms. So women are also often uh, depending on the geopolitical context, uh, overrepresented in part-time jobs and fixed-time contracts. Uh, women are in general located in jobs uh, whose economic features and potential for trade union organizations are limited. Uh, women are mostly present in less paid sectors of the economy and at lower positions within their hierarchical structure. Um, wage differentials, or the so-called gender wage gap, uh, between men and women across the world provide clear evidence to that. Uh, women are concentrated in services and mostly lower paid occupations. And we can see from uh, this graph uh, for the United States, which uh, shows us that uh, jobs with lowest wages are uh, care work jobs, uh, mostly that these jobs are mostly occupied by women. Um, so I won't read this graph, you can uh, look at it while I uh, go on. So uh, following the line of uh, argumentation provided by Ellen Makesins Wood, uh, the first point about capitalism is that it is indifferent to the social identities of the people it exploits. Uh, capital, of course, holds no prejudice against anyone, and it strives to absorb people into the labor market and to reduce them to interchangeable units of labor abstracted from any specific identity. Uh, that is why, according to Ellen Mason's Wood, uh, women were able to achieve important political rights without improving their economic position significantly at the same time. Uh, we can think of political and other non-economic rights in capitalism as capitalism's currency, but that currency has been drastically devalued. Uh, this basic remark can help us understand why feminist movements in capitalist economies at least have been unable to change the living conditions of majority of women. Uh, but more specifically, in order to explain the data for the last couple of decades, we need to examine the role of feminism in that specific period of time. So in general, uh, it is uh, known that feminism today uh, doesn't represent a serious threat to the capitalist status quo in any significant way. Uh, there are several somewhat opposing uh, views on the link between feminism and capitalism or feminism and neoliberalism. Uh, some are claiming that feminism has been co-opted or seduced by neoliberalism, while others are presenting that as a part of a general defeat and disorganization of the left. Uh, without going into that debate, uh, it is, uh, we can tell that, uh, uh, some, that these processes resulted uh, definitely in some uh, general trends like uh, academization and cul culturalization of feminism alongside the NGOization and uh, the emergence of the so-called free market feminism, which is usually dealing with successful business women and their uh, hardships. Uh, so concerning the NGOs, 
um, to eradicate gender-based inequalities and uh, following the goals set within uh, United Nations Beijing Platform for Action in 1995, uh, governments committed and introduced measures that promote gender equality and women's empowerment. And parallel to this, efforts to mainstream gender across ministries at national and local levels uh, have been put into place. So uh, there's been a gradual building of awareness among policymakers and statistical agencies. Uh, needless to say, the, the evidence so far uh, indicates quite clearly that these programs for women are not effective in achieving their goals, uh, of course, because the broader set of uh, macroeconomic conditions are working in precisely the opposite direction. Uh, concerning the phenomena of academization and culturalization of feminism, uh, it resulted in a shift away uh, from analysis of women's position within capitalism uh, toward other themes like language, culture, and so on. The problem with that uh, sequence of events is that the issue of gender economic inequality itself became open towards the influence of economics uh, and more specifically neoclassical economics. Uh, it is important to understand uh, the neoclassical economic approach to explaining women's position in the society uh, because of its influence on other social sciences as well as on the common sense, but also for the potential it provides to leftist feminist approach and I will come back to this positive side uh, of neoclassical economics later. Uh, so neoclassical economics develops an analysis of equilibrium supply and demand uh, through the mechanism of the market, uh, but it also believes that these uh, principles are universal and can be extended uh, to topics like marriage, fertility, women's employment patterns, and so on. Uh, in neoclassical economic uh, theory, individuals are taken to be uh, maximizers of uh, utility functions and consequently marriage is seen as a contract in which it is agreed to exchange certain goods and services between husband and wife resulting in mutual uh, profit. Uh, it is assumed that the husband will be providing money and the wife will be providing services, uh, services of different kinds. Uh, this theory holds uh, an implicit uh, assumption that men and women begin from a division of labor, with men, of course, advantaged in the labor market and women in the home. Uh, this is usually taken to be a consequence of given biological differences. So uh, neoclassical economics fails to uh, locate the family and sexual division of labor in a wider context. Um, as it also fails to locate um, anything, for example, markets in wider uh, context as well. Of course, this model is um, ridiculous, not only because of that, but also because it uh, looks uh, in a trans-historical way at the breadwinner model as the only imaginable organization of the household. While in reality, uh, as we know, the breadwinner model represented only a tiny uh, portion of um, capitalism's history and is geographically specific and even while it existed uh, it did not apply to a major part of families. Uh, after all, uh, the history has shown that uh, uh, the breadwinner model is not universal and so neoclassical economics had to change its model and this is how it was done. So uh, when women entered into the labor market, uh, in the case of explaining pay differences between men and women, uh, focus has been upon the different characteristics that they bring to the labor market, uh, differences in human capital and stability in, uh, alongside with commitments to work. It is argued that once we take this, uh, these differences into account, then the fact that men are paid more than women will disappear. So women and men with the same human capital will be paid the uh, same wages. Uh, but if we ask a neoclassical e economist why are the differences in the human capital uh, there in the first place, uh, he will say that these are reflections on, of women's and men's different choices. And this is how we end up with perceiving the differences between men and women in the labor market as a consequence of individual choices. It is also important to uh, notice that the neoclassical economics uh, analysis of women's employment patterns uh, has, had developed uh, thanks to uh, Gary Becker and Associates in uh, the 
uh, same time when Marxist feminism was way more influential than today. And this is why uh, back in those days there was no chance of interference between feminism and this type of economic theory. Uh, but today, sadly, this is not the case, uh, and even nominally feminist uh, organizations and groups uh, are taking over the data from economic research uh, together with uh, some of them, uh, their assumptions as, as well. And this often results in uh, fetishism of free choice and individualism, or in a slightly better scenario, uh, it is combined with some vague notion of discrimination against women. Uh, as a consequence, uh, feminist scholars or institutions, uh, who, or institutions whose aim is to help women, uh, they promote the idea of work-life balance as a woman's issue exclusively, and they advocate more flexible work arrangements for women. Uh, this, of course, serves to continue the sexual division of labor, both in households and uh, as well as in the labor market. Um, now we will go back to neoclassical economics and I will uh, offer a rather provocative idea that uh, neoclassical economics has actually been more helpful to understanding, uh, for understanding women's economic position than ma mainstream or liberal feminism. Uh, why? Uh, neoclassical economics uh, forged a connection between female labor market participation and family formation and inequality in pay and employment although within its um, unacceptable theoretical framework, but still. Uh, but in short, it forged a connection between paid and unpaid labor, while mainstream feminism has often failed to do so. Uh, neoclassical economics has come to the conclusion that uh, domestic labor is, important, uh, is an important determinant of women's uh, employment patterns and economic position because lost hours of work and lost work experience determine their inferior economic position. Um, so another graph. Uh, in this ugly graph we can see that from the 60s uh, to the 90s women's share of household work has remained almost uh, unchanged despite increases in paid work. Uh, I put this data for Canada, but data from other uh, developed Western economies which are available uh, give uh, the same results and show that women are doing uh, half as much of housework compared to their partners. So now uh, all that has to be done is to develop a proper theory for uh, understanding of this um, uh, relationship between paid and unpaid labor. As a basis of that theory, we should, of course, take uh, Marxist feminism. Um, so Marxist feminist theory, uh, by placing the notion of housework or domestic work in the historical context of development of industrial capitalism, uh, revealed the fundamental structural separation between the domestic home economy and the profit-oriented economy. Uh, of course, beyond the physical separation of home and uh, factory. Uh, this separation was crucial because it re-evaluated uh, economic production and defined domestic labor as an inferior form of work as compared to capitalist wage labor because housework does not generate profit. Uh, an important uh, ideological byproduct of this radical economic transformation was the birth of the housewife. Uh, women began to be ideologically redefined as the guardians of a devalued uh, domestic sphere. And now I will quote Charlotte Perkins Gilman. So, quote, um, uh, the phrase domestic work does not apply to a special kind of work, but to a certain grade of work, a state of development through which all kinds pass. All industries were once domestic, that is, were performed at home and in the interests of the family. Uh, end of quote. Uh, of course, today with the rise of uh, the service sector and commodification of care work, we can see the, uh, clearly the artificial divide between this uh, domestic and wage labor. Um, now, a comparison with pre-capitalist societies uh, is needed. So, in pre-capitalist uh, feudal societies, it was not uh, just the peasant himself, but the peasant household that constituted uh, the basic unit of production as well as the basic unit of uh, exploitation. Um, 
the division of labor has been uh, linked to the demands uh, placed upon household unit by its role in the process of exploitation. Uh, the labor appropriated from the peasantry has been family labor, uh, had been family labor, uh, so not only productive rent or tax producing uh, services, but also domestic labor and of course the reproduction of the labor force itself. Um, just a moment. Uh -huh. uh, in capitalism, uh, this unity of work uh, has, has been divided into the public uh, productive sphere and the so-called private sphere of the households, which is considered to be a non-economic sphere. In pre-capitalist societies, uh, of course, a gender division of labor existed, but uh, it was, and it was, of course, unequal, but uh, complementary because women's uh, tasks in the household were considered as much productive as men's uh, tasks. While in capitalism, this has transformed into a hierarchical gender division of labor. Uh, this is why Marxist or socialist feminism claims that domestic labor is an economic activity essential to capitalist production. Uh, according to Lisa Fogel, for example, uh, the Marxist concept of necessary labor has, has to be re redefined so that it actually consists of two components. The first discussed by Marx is necessary labor that produces value equivalent to wages. And this part of necessary labor, of course, uh, is inseparable from production of the surplus value. But the second component is the unwaged work that contributes to the daily and long-term renewal of the commodity labor power and the working class as a whole. Uh, the domestic component of necessary labor or domestic labor uh, lacks exchange value on the market, but nonetheless plays a key role in the process of uh, surplus value appropriation. Uh, domestic labor is unquantifiable, but it is indispensable to capitalist social reproduction, just as socially necessary waged labor, of course. Um, this is something that traditional Marxists did not accept. Uh, their response to Marxist feminist theorizing of unpaid uh, reproductive work was that domestic labor is concrete individual labor, while only waged labor is abstract social labor, so it shouldn't be uh, subject to Marxist analysis. Uh, and this kind of Marxism is rightly termed mechanical Marxism, but we will come back to that soon. Uh, so in Marxist feminist uh, theory, Waged labor sustain, sustained by housework uh, brings its labor power to the market and thereby transfers uh, through the work process value and surplus value to commodities, which through the market are converted into money. And this is crucial to understand. Uh, while we cannot say that unpaid household labor generates profit or surplus value, it is still engaged in monetary processes in other ways. Uh, while Marxist labor theory of value uh, cannot uh, help us with that, um, uh, there is another theory that perhaps uh, can, and it is post-Keynesian household economics, uh, because it stresses the importance of household dependence uh, on money incomes. So um, unpaid household work is in the post-Keynesian framework, defined as work within monetary production. Uh, this is why the question of how reproductive activities are financed uh, is eminent just as that question must be raised about for market production. Um, labor power is produced in the sense that in a monetary production economy it requires money income that is subject to the monetary production process, so uh, reproductive work depends on money income. Uh, but of course, uh, unpaid household work uh, cannot entirely substitute money wages uh, because households are not self-sufficient or non-economic uh, units uh, because they need money to buy goods and services and to pay their uh, tax obligations. Uh, this, uh, very simplified, uh, explains the involvement of households and unpaid work within them in the overall economy. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, political implications of treating households as uh, non-economic units and unpaid uh, work within them as a private thing of the family, which usually means a private thing of women, uh, liberal feminism is suggesting uh, redistributing housework to men and women alike by raising consciousness. 
Uh, but this does not, of course, constitute a satisfactory solution, not only because of the social conventions related to uh, masculinity and femininity, but because of the organization of waged labor. Uh, also, when it comes to liberal and NGO feminism, uh, introducing policies for women empowerment and at the same time dismantling the welfare state and privatizing uh, social services, childcare and so on, shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the causes of inequality between men and women. Uh, the same goes for ideas of family-friendly policies for women, uh, which result in continuing the subordinated position of women. So uh, what are the alternatives to that? Um, now we can reconsider uh, the claim uh, from the beginning that capitalism uh, doesn't require gender inequality and that it holds no prejudice against anyone. So uh, and at an abstract level, of course, we can agree with that. Uh, but however, capitalism does require minimizing the costs of social reproduction as well as production. Uh, uh, by defining the domestic labor in this way, uh, it itself become, becomes a concept specific to capitalism and without fixed gender assignment, which is useful. But this is where we need to turn from abstract theory to real historically situated capitalism, which we have done, hopefully. And we saw that capitalism has always been dependent on, uh, upon patriarchy. This naturally places feminist uh, movement within the leftist politics and leftist movements. So apart from uh, the wages for housework uh, movement, um, uh, which served more as a political uh, statement than a real demand, uh, socialist feminism has always uh, advocated the socialization of housework. Uh, the only significant steps toward that have been in fact taken in the existing socialist countries. So now we have data for uh, East Germany before uh, 89. So uh, in shortly, um, we can see that the rate of participation of women in the labor force was much higher in East Germany than in West Germany. Uh, female unemployment was unexistent. Uh, the gender pay gap was lower than on the West. Uh, and the birth rate uh, was higher. So the reasons for this, are here, some of them. So uh, in East Germany, um, the, we can say that uh, there was uh, a partial socialization of uh, house, housework and childcare because women had a fully paid maternity leave and available free daycare centers for children. That is below. Okay. Um, so uh, working women, uh, therefore have a vital interest in the struggle for socialism. Uh, according to socialist feminism, there is a possibility of transforming the nature of housework in a more radical way than it uh, had been done in existing socialist states. Uh, examples for this can be found, for example, in the works of uh, American uh, feminists, uh, Melusina Faye Pierce, Mary Livermore and Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Uh, who had ideas of, uh, about designing physical space to create cooperative housekeeping, kitchenless houses, uh, day, uh, daycare centers, public kitchens, and community dining halls. So we have a connection with uh, the previous talk. Uh, and now, in the end, uh, a few comments about uh, feminism and the left. Uh, according to feminists uh, who participated in the radical social movements, uh, in the 70s, uh, the left was mostly hostile to the notion of developing a feminist socialism, and very often feminism was considered an inherently bourgeois ideology, as well as a threat to the unity of working class. In the following uh, decades and until now, uh, Marxist theorists continue to be generally inattentive to socialist feminist thought, and most of them do not engage in the issues of women's so social subordination. Um, as I said earlier, the Marxist reaction to the domestic labor debate, if any, uh, was negative because of its uh, narrowed focus on the waged productive labor. So in that way, the issues of social reproduction have been reduced to the so-called woman question, 
supposedly residing somewhere in the superstructure, and so its embodiment in ongoing political economy uh, was denied. Uh, this approach, of course, should be abandoned, and uh, uh, a wider theor theoretical range than could be provided by, uh, provided by Marxist value theory alone should be developed. Uh, because the Marxist uh, uh, value theory was developed only to explain, uh, as we know, the productive side of capitalism, as Michael Lebowitz and Marx himself have stated. So we need to understand domestic labor as a more abstract feature of uh, capitalism centering on social uh, reproduction. And only that way we can uh, come to uh, have a kind of feminism and a kind of Marxism whose interests are uh, highly compatible. So the extension of Marxist analysis to the issues of family and reproduction shouldn't be considered as an exclusively women's issue, but instead uh, they should be considered as a fundamental concept in general analysis of capitalism. So that much about uh, feminism and the left. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dora, for the presentation and for this uh, the way you connected the, the level of analytical insight with the implications for the uh, solutions to the political uh, 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 problems and all the contradictions that we uh, met in that, that we can meet in this uh, translation, so-called translation process. So we now, I will now open the discussion and it, for comments, questions, whatever you want. Uh, the other question is, for Dora, um, uh, with regard to, to table one, labor force participation, uh, again, we are looking uh, at the whole of Europe yes. uh, uh, with socialist countries or without them, because at the end you, you pointed to, to the DDR as a, some kind of model for uh, women's emancipation. Uh, that, that's a kind of risky move, uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, it would be interesting to see whether uh, this chart applies to uh, Western European countries or Europe as a whole, uh, so that we can see, but because you know, the important point is whether uh, a political and different political and, and institutional regimes make any different any difference with regard to, to uh, labor, for, uh, labor force uh, participation and gender gap and so on and, and so forth. So this is, if we, if, if we had some kind of disaggregated data, it would be much more, I think, clear what type of you know, policy one should follow and support, I, I think. And, well, I'm not going to go into this Marxian business, uh, but I do uh, kind of appreciate the, the this uh, gentle move to a post-Keynesian uh, framework. Okay, that's it. Uh, it's more comment. Uh, maybe I come to a question, I don't know. Um, to Dora first. Um, I like the move to the GDR um, because, in fact, it's a thing we have to reclaim again and again. But um, if you look at the high rank in the party, the high ranks in the factories, the high ranks in whatever services, the female participation was very low. If you look at the distribution of domestic labor, it was 95% women and the rest maybe men, although both were going to work. But in the household, the distinction was quite the same as in the West. So it, it is, in fact, uh, in a way of uh, socializing care work, they were far more developed than the West. But, yeah, <laughs> okay. And um, then I don't know exactly what you mean when you said um, that patriarchy was always connected to capitalism. Yes, of course. But if you want to understand why uh, the division of labor was formed in such a way you have to look historically also on the struggles of the labor movement, male and female. Because of the devastating social relations of women in the factories, and especially of child labor in the factories, the labor movement struggled against the participation of women and child in the production. 
and the women also struggled for that. So that kind of breadwinner family was also a result of labor struggles and led to this kind of patriarchy, but also to what later became the welfare state, things like that. So it's a, a very contradictory move. It's not only some kind of uh, ruling whatever patriarchy, but it's this combination of, of, of rule and struggles from below that led to this form of patriarchy. And if you want to come to a more progressive move, um, as you said, uh, and as also Eva said, to put the production into the center of a um, whatever, new alternative, um, a thing also proposed, uh, at least in part, by the left in Germany, um, then you very quickly came to the point that you made that the distinction between domestic or reproductive and productive is of course a historical one and not really a theoretical because then you have these, uh, uh, all these moves to uh, socialization of care work and whatever and directly came into labor struggles, female labor struggles, what is uh, right now the strikes um, in services for instance women's strikes are the most impressive and uh, radicals uh, in Germany right now. And uh, the whole labor movement is trying to reorganize around that. So again, it is intertwined in a very in interesting way. So um, you see, I don't come to a question, but uh, at least to a comment. Okay, first um, about socialism and the uh, division of uh, labor between men and women. So um, I uh, use this example from East Germany, not to uh, advocate uh, uh, such a political system in the future, but to show that what was available for working women there and uh, the consequences of that, uh, including particip participation rates uh, in the labor market and so on. So as a Slovenian, um, feminist Liliana Burzer would say, uh, women could only dream about, uh, in, on the West, could only dream about what women in socialism had. That's, that's it. Uh, and of course, um, you said about um, Yugoslavia, I think, or, and some socialist states, uh, about the unequal position of men and women. Oh, yeah. uh, also, okay, everywhere, I mean, Yugoslavia also. So. Uh, of course, uh, that uh, this existed, and it is even claimed that in Yugoslavia, for example, the gender wage gap did not exist, which I think is not, uh, I, I know that is not true, because it's precisely because of the uh, segmentation of the labor force by gender, uh, horizontal uh, and also vertical. Um, so, and the last part, uh, uh, pa patriarchy and capitalism, well, of course, I agree with you. I have nothing to say. Uh, labor movements are uh, the other side that has to be taken into account while talking about patriarchy in specific uh, phases of capitalism. But I think that it can be uh, said that patriarchy, um, at, at least the, the, the notion of uh, unpaid uh, household labor has been a constant throughout uh, capitalism at, in every level, uh, every phase of capitalism, so that's how I use the patriarchy. And of course, it's always tricky to use this uh, notion of patriarchy because of all of its different um, definitions. Um, okay, and Mislav? Uh -huh. This uh, uh, graph is for Western uh, European countries only, without socialist countries, and I think without even, yeah, without socialist countries. Uh, and I used it only in an illustrative uh, manner because I wanted to use it as, a, as a, an, an example of um, how uh, mainstream feminism or, I don't know, mainstream whatever uh, is... Um <laughs> okay, this is uh, used often as an uh, uh, example of uh, improvement of women's economic position and I just picked up any uh, graph I could, found, uh, I could find just to... Uh, go beyond that and explain uh, what are the problems uh, behind that. We give some more questions, comments, Tom? 
I think there is uh, an article by Steve Peshoor hanging outside from 1975 where he disparages with this idea that we Yugoslavs work uh, far less than uh, the Germans and the people in the West and then he goes on to explain how um, uh, the productive economy is supplemented by uh, people working their land and stuff like that. I think it's also uh, uh, that in <clears throat> particularly outside of, of the capitalist core, you always have uh, concomitant uh, modes of production and capitalism is oftentimes supplemented by a uh, domestic economy uh, in many places. Uh, and this is evident there, I think, as well. He goes on to say that uh, there are four and a half million people working. I know that's probably Yugoslavia, uh, sounds, too, a number too small for Yugoslavia, but and 1.3 million are working their land while also working in, in, in uh, factories. So I think that's that's one element that should be also taken into consideration. I think that Michael Perman uh, makes a point around this that uh, when you look at the primitive accumulation, there is a strong element of that that uh, capitalism always tried to reduce the price of labor by supplementing its uh, mode of production with, with sort of d domestic economy. And um, also, uh, I think it's interesting uh, from the point of view of uh, disabled people that uh, uh, pre-capitalist economies uh, had a form of including them in forms of productivity. But in capitalism, uh, people with disability are always greater costs than uh, can serve the extraction of profit. So I think that's also uh, an interesting aspect of uh, comparison uh, between pre-capitalist and capitalist economies. Okay, so I have, a, I have also a comment uh, which goes um, along what Dora was saying about um, what women had in socialism uh, compared to Western Europe. Um, so um, how should I frame this? First of all, to say that, of course, we we need to go back and look at different types of policies which we think are um, useful and progressive in terms of what they do in, in terms of socializing unpaid labor and so forth. But it's important to also uh, keep in mind that women's lives were very, very, you know, en enormously different in, in Yugoslavia in, um, among themselves. What I mean is that when you say you know, there was a, a policy which said you had a guaranteed number of months after you have a baby and then you had childcare, but at the same time the reach of the policy was very, you know, very, very small. And we know that, for example, in Croatia, when we left Yugoslavia and, you know, in the early 90s, we had very uh, low rates of coverage of childcare because it only, re only reached uh, cities, basically, and if you lived outside of a big city, then your life was dramatically different. And I think that's really important to keep in mind in terms of um, yeah, the coverage and how, uh, how extensive this was. So yes, you know, a good policy, but um, when you say women in socialism had something that the West didn't, in this, at the same time in, I don't know, Scandinavian countries, the reach of socialized childcare was much, much bigger than in Yugoslavia. Okay. I agree. <laughs> Okay, uh, Dora agrees. <laughs> so we, we have to conclude uh, the, uh, this panel. Maybe the best way is, is to be in a formula combined of these two presentations. The question is, so will German Democratic Republic plus post Keynesianism provide a better chance for help? <laughs> so uh, now, uh, just announcement in 15 minutes uh, is the keynote lecture today, Mario Candeas. So just 15 minutes break and then we continue. Thank you.